Hey Twitter, um, I'm Emily Inkpen and this is my 10,000 followers Twitter Q&A. So um, what I do is like every thousand followers that I get, I um, started doing a Q&A where I just say, ask me anything and I will record a video answering your questions, which is either incredibly brave or incredibly stupid. Um, <laughs> I literally answer anything that you give me. Uh, so the questions that are coming up are, yeah, all of the questions that were asked. Um, in the meantime, I mean, I just have to say 10,000 followers is a lot and I wasn't really expecting to get here any time ever and it sort of crept up on me and I mean, answering your questions is the least I can do because the amount of support that I get from all of you all the time and the amount of sanity that I get from all of you because otherwise writing is a really siloed thing you're like you're on your own and you're in like your own head and Twitter writing community is almost like a, a support group <laughs> for writers um, and I think that artistically it's just really really important to have that network and be able to be like to share the difficulty that comes from being creative, especially in the last year when the whole world has been nuts and being creative has been so difficult. Um, and it has been difficult and it's been incredibly busy and I'm not alone in feeling it. And yeah, I mean, the writing community has definitely got me through. I don't think, I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for you guys just sparing me on and giving me a reason to keep going. Um, so yeah, uh, I think answering your questions is like the biggest pleasure ever at this point and 10,000 followers, it just blows my mind. Um, so yeah, I guess onwards onto the questions. I think that's more of an intro I gave than last time. Um, so yeah, a little bit nervous about this. Um, okay, uh, first question is, have you a favourite sentence from The Blood Road? Okay, so for those of you who don't know, uh, The Blood Road is the first book in the Dex trilogy of books that I'm working on, and it's currently in publisher submission. Um, it's also, there's, there's an audio drama um, that is a prequel and it's set 11 years before The Blood Road starts, and the sequel it, to that audio drama is coming out really, really soon. So the first one is called The Bomb and the sequel that's coming out soon is called The Hunt. And um, there's a lot of really exciting stuff around it. There's like extra material coming out. I've got a whole website coming out to support it and just show maps and all the stuff. Like I've got um, the actor profiles, I've got the music, I've got everything on there. Um, so it's a really exciting thing. I'm really looking forward to launching it. Um, but yeah, that's the blood road and that's the world that surrounds it and um, the sort of context there. And yeah, so do I have a favourite sentence from the blood road? Um, actually, no favourite sentences. Um, I think that, I mean, I have a few favourite sentences from short stories and things that I've written, um, but in a book that's over 150,000 words, long, the individual sentences kind of get lost. And I've definitely got some favourite scenes and favourite, um, you know, moments in it. Favourite favorite sort of like tracks of dialogue, but individual lines, not so much. And I feel like almost for the reader, that's easier to sort of home in on. Um, because as a re reader, you're sort of taking that outside stance. And I've definitely said to writers, I'm like, you know, that line that you wrote, I just read it over and over again because I loved it. And they were like, really? <laughs> so I feel like as a, as a writer, you don't necessarily get that outside perspective and that moment of like, wow, that was profound. Um, so I'm hoping that in the 150,000 words I've written, there's gonna be a sentence that you can latch onto. But me personally, I think it's just lost in the, in the magnitude of that. Um, so the next question is, if the Blood Road was made into a video game, what kind would it be? Like first person shooter, strategy, etc. Okay, so I think a story driven RPG would probably suit it most. Um, 
I mean, there'd be huge stretches of combat and a lot of scope for character building as well. And sort of episodic level building and sort of character abilities being unlocked as treatments are had. So the main characters in the Blood Road are genetically mutilated super soldiers and they were adopted by this weapons manufacturer as perfectly normal children and then given treatments that would that unlock their like not unlock that's a gaming term but they sort of take that they do things to them so in a gaming perspective that would be like you go in you'd have treatments you'd come out you'd be able to do some stuff that you wouldn't have been able to do before um but then also because of the story, I guess you'd have treatments and some of the treatments would set you back in some ways as well. So that's definitely a part of the story is like, you know, there are moments where the treatments, you, you got unintended side effects coming out and the kids really suffer with those. And you get the sort of, you know, they're lab rats basically, and they're at the mercy of the people who are treating them and the people who are, who own them basically. And so, in a game context, it would be really interesting to play with that. Like, you know, you're going in for a treatment. Are you going to come out being more awesome or are you going to come out puking blood? Who knows? <laughs> Flip a coin. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess there's a lot of um, interesting ideas that could come out of that. Yeah, I have ideas. I could ramble about that for a whole long time. OK, um, who's your dream author to collaborate with? That's a good one because there are many. Um, but I think probably, I mean, if I was going to do a collaboration that would be sort of challenging and also, you know, obviously the dream. Um, so Aliette de Baudard, she, her voice is just awesome and I could learn a hell of a lot from her. And I think she would bring a whole new dimension to anything that I do because her style is so different to mine and I mean that's that's given the fact that I could maybe stop fangirling over her for five minutes and actually get some work done <laughs> um, but if, if I could do that and achieve that no guarantees there but it would be a really really interesting project and I think I would oh my god I would just massively I would learn a hell of a lot from her um and I think the mix of our voices would be really interesting as well from like a reader point of view. Um, okay, what did you read growing up and who are your literary inspirations? Okay, so my dad read me The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings when I was six. Um, wasn't necessarily meant to be like that. My sister was nine and he started reading her The Hobbit and he got a couple of chapters in before I realised what was going on. And I was six at the time and I was like, no, 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 I want to be involved. And uh, I was the little, little sister just being like, I don't want to be left out. So luckily and very nicely, my sister at the age of nine said, if we can start again, Emily can be involved. She was a champ. And um, yeah, so I got involved with that. So some of my earliest memories are with my dad sitting um, in my room that I shared with my sister later. Uh, yeah, but I shared with my sister. He'd be sitting in the corner reading his Lord of the Rings. And that's really, really huge memory for me. And definitely a classic example of a parent picking a book they want to read at bedtime, as opposed to picking a book that your kid wants you to read at bedtime. But we loved it. Um, so my mum read me a bunch of Enid Blyton classics and Swallows and Amazons, and you know, like those standards. And then when I was nine-ish, I really hooked onto the Harry Potter series and that was basically me for a long time and then it wasn't until university that I really hooked on to sci-fi as a genre um, but that's no bad thing because I think writers can get too stuck in the genre in which they write and it's hugely beneficial to read widely and I've spent a lot of time with like Angela Carter, Muriel Spark, Jane Austen, Charles Dickens, Bram Stoker, Hardy Shakespeare, Milton, Plato, Daphne de Maurier, the Bronte sisters, Monica Ali, Salman Rushdie, Graham Greene, Shinoa Achebe, Sam Selvan, Camus. Um, so sci-fi. So like, yeah, I mean, like all of those are incredible and hugely diverse. 
and then it wasn't like sci-fi really sort of captured my imagination when I was discovering the works of Ursula Le Guin who showed up a lot on my university reading lists and that also happened at the time when I was studying philosophy and there was a lot of sort of parallels because of course Ursula Le Guin's work is really really philosophical and that just blew my mind like she gave me a window into some philosophical concepts that I wouldn't have got otherwise um so yeah my literary inspirations are just really really wide and yeah really really wide <laughs> um okay next question how do you approach racial diversity when it comes to telling your stories is it part of your process do you relate to a character's race do you relate a character's race based on backstory do you, do certain regions have higher numbers of certain races right okay um, so the term race is problematic to me and it is inherently earth-based. So you've got to think about the fact that um, the word race comes from, it originally came from like geographically defined regions and a lot of outdated beliefs that have become like some of which have become less and less relevant over time and some of them have become more and more relevant over time. Um, but call it idealistic, but by the time my ancestors in my series left Earth to seed the colonies on like the planet SP714, for instance, the colour of someone's skin didn't matter. And as a result, the world of SP714 is diverse in skin tones um, across the board in every country and nothing is made of that and the diversity is everywhere. The reason I did this, there's a, there's a big reason why I did this, and it's because a lot of old school sci-fi is very sexist. And for instance, I'm reading Asimov at the moment and it boggles my mind that this guy who could imagine so much, he, he could just see this entire universe, but he couldn't imagine a scenario in which women could be as capable as men. Like that was beyond his imagination. And I don't think it's beyond possible to get to a state of equality. So I chose to set my book in a future where the colour of a person's skin is as relevant as the colour of their eyes. Which for the record is not relevant at all. Okay, so as for representing different races in the main characters, well, Varian has dark skin, Isra has lighter skin, but she's still brown. I mean, I suppose she would be considered like Indian in appearance and Ren is as pale as pale can be, like ginger pale, but he's blonde. Um, and it was important for me to be explicit about this, purely because I think like, diversity in skin tones is important and it should be normalised um, in what we read. There's a certain amount of beliefs, like, you know, I see questions on Twitter, it's like, you know, if you're writing somebody of a different skin tone, should you mention it? And I'm like, well, if, a skin tone is it's, if a skin tone is like hair tone in terms of just a physical characteristic yes you say someone has brown hair they have brown hair if you say they've got blue eyes they've got blue eyes if you say they've got brown skin they've got brown skin who it doesn't make any difference to the character it just allows the reader to picture that person better and more genuinely and the fact is in our world as it is at the moment, if you don't mention the colour of someone's skin, a lot of readers will by default think of them as white. And that is a problem. And I don't want my book to be like that, especially when some of the main characters are not like that. And I want it to be absolutely 100% clear that they are not. Um, it also comes down to the fact that Isra and Ren, who are like, adopted siblings and they have this relationship which is weird enough but I want to make it absolutely clear that they are not related by blood and that helps but yeah the diversity thing is really important to me and yeah on on my planet 
I think I think that basically I have I have strong feelings about this, but I feel like in order to get to the point that we are traveling to distant stars, we need to get over certain fundamental points. And one of and, and some of those points are we need to get over judging people's worth by the color of their skin, by their gender, by who they decide to love, by what they decide to do to their body. It's none of our business and it's completely irrelevant. And every time people question any of those things, it's dragging our species backwards. That's what it feels like. We need to shed these problems that we have inherent in our society so that we can take the next step forward. And as a result, I feel like if you've got a race of people, a, a race of species, a, the human race needs to shed all of that in order to take the next step. Um, so yeah, for me, we wouldn't even get to the next step of going to other planets if we still had hang-ups about this stuff. It just wouldn't happen. Um, so that's, that's how I feel about that. Quite strong feelings about that. I really hope that people don't um, get offended and don't unfollow me for what I just said. If, if, you, if you are offended and if you do, don't really know what to say. I'm not sorry that I feel like that. See ya. <laughs> okay, um, next question. Uh, I don't know if this has already been asked, but which is your favorite t-shirt? My favorite is, uh, yeah, so this black and yellow Zelda Triforce. Um, it's the first nerdy t-shirt that I got and it's still my favorite and it just fits really well and it's comfy and it's black and that helps because I sometimes when I'm eating I miss my mouth and it's just practical. Um, yeah, I'm a bit of a klutz. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's, it's my favorite and I love it. Um, all right. Should my next novel be a written, a rewritten version of history because we can't seem to live in the present Ooh. or should I just continue with book two? No idea. Write what you want. Whatever interests you. Write, write what you want. If you feel angry about the fact that we can't seem to live in the present, bring it out in your narrative, go for it. Okay, favorite video game of all time. Okay, so despite the t-shirt, I'm gonna say uh, Final Fantasy VII and Skyrim. Um, Final Fantasy VII because it kind of hit me at a really, really influential time in my teens and it has impacted a lot on my writing and I love the sort of cyberpunk edge to it. I just, it's brilliant. Um, I really enjoy that. And Skyrim because it's super chill and I still just love hanging out in there and doing weird little side quests and it's, it's great for a brain break. It really is. It, it switches off my mind and my mind is really, really busy most of the time, but I'm in there as soon as I log into Skyrim and I'm just in there, it's like vroom, playing. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. I can feel my brain recharging. Um, what devices, computers do you use for writing? Okay, so I'm a bit faddy on the devices. Uh, my spouse is a software developer, so they have a lot of tech and I am happy to get the devices that they're not using anymore. Um, so when I was commuting, I liked using the iPad with the um, keyboard because it didn't break my back when I was walking around. Since lockdown, I've gone back to the laptop um, and that's really it, iPad or laptop. Um, the only problem with switching between iPad and laptop is the touch screen element of things. So if I'm using the iPad for a while, then normally like if you if you wanna go up a thing, you have to touch the screen. And then when I go back to the laptop, I'm going, mm, mm, and it's, it's not working. And then I'm like, oh yeah, okay, fine. And, and then it's like just fingerprints all over the screen and it's just, you have to laugh at yourself. <laughs> but yeah, so that's the only drawback of doing that. Um, what software and apps do you use for writing? So I use Google Docs to write in. Um, I like the fact that there's an automatic save. I like the fact that you can access the documents wherever you are. So as long as you have an internet connection, you can log into Gmail, you can log into your Google account and you can get to your book wherever you are. So that's really comforting to me. Um, you know, I could go visit 
my mom and sit down at her computer and be working on my book, no problem. You know, even even if I didn't have my computer with me or my iPad or whatever. Um, and that is great. I love that technology can do that. Um, what are the best and worst aspects of your chosen tools? Um, so I haven't really thought about the worst bits. Generally speaking, I sort of just crack on and anything that annoys me, annoys me for the moment that it annoys me. And then as soon as I start working, I forget about it. Um, my spouse is the one that uses software and then just sort of makes a list of all the things that's, that's wrong with the software. And I mean, that's their job. They're a software developer. Uh, so they do that in the same way that I read things and I'm like, well, they could have done that better. Or, you know, like, you know, that's, that's, you know, or, or I watch TV shows or movies and I'm like, what is with this dialogue? Uh, <laughs> and that's my job. Their job is software. So I, I guess I outsource my uh, app angst to them which is you know one of us for each i think i think that covers it um if you could turn into a fire breathing dragon what would you do that's a great question probably set fire to a few things not necessarily on purpose um hopefully harmless things <laughs> um and then i would probably go somewhere less populated uh I think people are still, I mean, like people still love a good monster hunt and they'd want to hunt me down and stick me in a zoo or a lab or something. They definitely would. People are people. Are people. Um, so if I could become a fire breathing dragon, I'd probably take myself off and live in Iceland or somewhere like that and live in peace. Just truly satisfied by the fact that I could set fire to anyone anytime if I wanted to. It's got to, it's got to be satisfying, right? I think I think I get a lot of kicks out of that. Um, how much time do you spend on Twitter? Ah, okay. Um, so some would say too much, but I see it as time invested. Okay, so this is where a bit of cynicism is going to come out um, with regards to Twitter. And so my book is not a simple sci-fi. And it might be hard for a publisher to calculate return on investment. Um, and this is what I mean about being cynical. I mean, we've got to talk about business side of publishing here. Um, if my book was a straight space opera, they could think, OK, well, we published one of these by a debut author last year. It sold X amount. Therefore, we can calculate that if we publish another space opera by a debut author this year, we can calculate it will probably earn roughly the same amount of money. Therefore, it is a good return on our investment. But with my book, there's nothing really like it. And we talked a little bit earlier about literary influences. And when I was applying, like, when I was querying, um, John Gerald, my agent, uh, asked for three comparative titles and I couldn't come up with any. Literally none. And I said this before sending my query, I said there's nothing out there like my book. And he, we, we had this, this sort of back and forth trying to work out what to do about this. And he said he'd take a look anyway. And he agreed there's nothing like it, which was kind of a relief because obviously John Jarrett is incredibly well read and everything. And if I'd sent it to him after saying there's nothing like it, and then he, he got it and was like, well, it's just like this one. What are you talking about? I'd have been like, but luckily he, uh, he said, no, there's literally nothing like this. And, you know, I, I sort of, I, I said, you know, I've been describing it as the Lannisters in space. And he said, like, I hear what you're saying about the Lannisters in space, but that doesn't even come close to what you've got here. I'm like, I know. Um, but the fact is, is that that means that it's potentially really difficult to place. And luckily, John didn't see that as an issue. So it didn't matter at the agent stage, but it might matter at the publishing stage. Um, so what I'm doing with all the time I spend on Twitter apart from making friends and staying sane and having that support group and, you know, like managing to interact with incredible writers and be inspired and all of those things, what I'm doing is building up 
a base of potential fans so that any publisher who's looking at me will hopefully see that there's an audience who are waiting and willing to read my book. And social media is a great way to do that. Um, but it does take time and it takes work and you can't buy that. Not really. Um, you just have to put in the work. Uh, but again, it's, it's time invested. It's all in the process. I get people sort of DMing me sometimes saying, how do you build up to 10,000 followers? And I'm like, you have to just work at it. And nobody likes to hear that. Nobody likes to hear that in order to make friends, you have to give a crap. <laughs> um, as, as silly as that sounds, people don't want to hear it. They want to hear, oh, what you do is you just spend five minutes on a Saturday and you like you, you schedule a bunch of tweets and then you go away and you forget about it for a week and you, you know, magically the people just rack up and you know, you've got all of this engagement and everything and it all just happens by magic. No, not in a million. If there's one thing that I have learned, watching videos, like, I mean, YouTubers are a great example. People say, oh yeah, YouTubers, all they do is they just sit and, you know, talk on a camera and they get loads of money. And I've watched YouTubers talk about their days, especially early in their channels. They were working like 16 hour days and not eating properly and barely sleeping because they were working so hard, making videos, churning out the content, getting to know people. There is no such thing as a free ride here, ever. And if you think that there's a shortcut, there isn't one. Buying followers on Twitter doesn't get you there. It doesn't. Because you, like I've seen people, 30,000 followers and they get one or two likes and they get you know, like a comment if they're lucky. And I am really lucky in my, in my, in my friends and you know, the 10,000 people that I have, oh my God, I love you guys so much because I tweet something and within 10 minutes I've got likes, I've got comments, I've got engagement. And I'm like, yes, I, this is what I need. I need the conversation because when I tweet, I want to talk. I want to talk to you all. And you're brilliant at it, you're so noisy, and I love it. Um, but then you've got people who think, oh yeah, I'll just take a shortcut, I'll just buy a bunch of followers. And then they're the ones that moan. They're the ones that are like, oh, why is it I've got all these followers and no one talks to me? I'm sorry. <laughs> this is me ranting. Okay, rant over. <laughs> right. Next question. Hold on, I might have a cup of tea. This is this is my cup of tea. You know, Harry Potter, nerdy as well. Uh, it's my favourite mug. Mm. Favourite writing mug. <laughs> right, rant end. Next question. Your blog is always so cool. Where do you get your inspiration? Okay, so I write blog posts only when I feel like I've got something to say. Um, so if I'm sort of writing and I, 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 if they're about writing, it's because I've thought of something that I do when writing that others might not, um, or I want to explore an idea or otherwise it's like, at the moment it's been interviews, like lately it's been interviews, which is kind of satiating my curiosity because I'm really interested in other authors and how other authors approach their work and what makes them tick. Um, and what their favourite biscuits are. Uh, that's the sole question. It really gets to the essence of a person. Genuinely, think to yourself, what is your favourite biscuit and why? I've asked this question of some very important people. At my last company, I asked it of the CEO. And you never really know how that's gonna go down, but I like to think that you, you get to know them. If they freak out and they don't answer it and they dismiss it, it says a lot about them as a person. Um, luckily my last CEO was a legend and he really considered the answer and I was like, respect. Um, anyway, uh, so I interviewed Chris Beckett a while back and uh, more recently I got to chat to Ida Kyo who won the BSFA for her short story, uh, which was great and I've got a big one coming up which I'm really excited about. Uh, I sent off the questions recently and so yeah, hopefully I'll be able to uh, launch that your way. Uh, really soon. So yeah, interviews are great fun and I like 
the fact that I can get more insight from other authors than me, I can give you guys more insight, and the biscuit question. It's all about the biscuit question. For me it is anyway. Okay. <laughs> Does writing short stories change your approach to writing chapters of a novel? Okay, so I've only been writing short stories more recently and I find it really hard. Um, my books run long, so as I said earlier, like 150,000 words. So writing a short story does not come naturally to me. Um, I'm not sure how it will affect writing longer form narrative. I hope it will help. I hope it will, you know, like change the way I, I write. I, hopefully all of my writing makes my writing better. I like the idea that if I'm writing anything, it helps and I'm learning something from it. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully it will change my approach to writing. Um, how do you go about naming your characters? Oh, this is fun. Okay. Um, so naming sounds, uh, like say, naming comes from the sounds and regional sort of phonetic propensities in languages. So when I was at uni, I studied phonetics. I studied English language a bit and I studied phonetics and I found that really fascinating. And so I work out if a language has a sort of leaning towards lots of thuz and yuz and, or if it comes with just really direct sort of use of letters and sounds with no weird, like, like th is a sound that you make with a th, but whether a language would actually have that sound um, at all. And... Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Alexa, hold on, I might just... Uh, yep, mute, there we go. <laughs> Alexa's not sure about that. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, where was I? Yeah, okay, so um, I don't really pain too much over it. Um, if if I'm sort of, if I sit there and basically roll around the sounds of that region in my mouth until, you know, until, until something comes into my head, it's sort of, it makes sense as a name. And then I'm like, okay, you know, that'll do. And uh, if it fits, it sits. And then with main characters, weirdly, they sort of come with their names attached. So, you know, like I could, I could potentially talk about the history of names on my planet because that's definitely a thing. And some regions hold on to sort of like the, the ancestral um, names and some don't. Um, and that's why you've got characters with the name like Nathaniel and Tristan alongside less Earth derivative names. Um, but that comes from a regional connection to the ancestral past. And in short, I could do a whole Q&A on this. Um, phonetics, language building. You know, I've got one country called Thos um, but th is not a, a sound that they actually have. They pronounce the d. So you you would read it the islands of Thos, but they're actually the islands of Dos um, in their language. That's how they say that sound. Um, so when I'm coming up with names, I I have to sort of say it not only how I would read it, but also how they would pronounce it, which is fun. Um, I really love phonetics. Love it. Um, are you going to write more creepy Victorian gaslight stories or at least continue to branch out with the odd wee side shiver alongside your sci-fi? Okay, so that was an unexpected side quest um, and it was really, really fun. I read a, uh, a submission, like a submission call for a anthology and it was for Gaslamp Fantasy and I've never written Gaslam Fantasy, but there was something in it. And then I read, I was like, okay, I'm interested in this. What is this? And I read the sort of description and I just got this image in my head. I was like, oh my God, I love this. So yeah, I wrote it. And I always thought I would be a sci-fi pure, like just pure sci-fi. And now I'm like, oh, maybe not. Because I, I just cheated on sci-fi and had this like minor affair with Gaslam Fantasy. And now I'm thinking, maybe I won't be a purist. Maybe I'll just be a little bit more easy about it, who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe it was a one-off. Maybe not. Depends how the story's received, I guess. If I get it back with a no, 
That was terrible. I'd be like, mm. <laughs> maybe not. Who knows? Uh, hmm. How long have you been wearing glasses? And if you wore them as a child, were you ever called four eyes or googly eyes? Okay, so my vision started to deteriorate in uni, uh, but I was picked on for other things. I've got plenty of things to be picked on. Um, so I have both asthma and eczema, and I get hay fever so badly, like biblical hay fever, like just, you know, like mucus just coming out of everywhere. Awful, awful, awful stuff. And back in high school, a few of my friends called me Flemmy. Um, which I didn't mind too much, I mean, I sympathised, I was really phlegmy <laughs> at certain times of the year, it was just terrible, and I did sympathise with them because as horrible it is, as it was for me, sitting next to somebody who's like, <laughs> like really suffering, is really annoying as well, so yeah, I was, I was phlegmy. Yeah, glamorous. Um, the ultimate question, why was there ever anything? Dum dum. Oh, okay, I try not to look for the reason in things, um, because the universe is nuts, and if there is reason there, I kind of think it's beyond human comprehension. Yet, maybe one day we'll evolve to the point where we can comprehend such things, but right now, especially given the last year, I don't necessarily think so. I think we've got a long way to go. Okay, describe your writing style as a real corporation. Which one and why? Interesting. I don't know. Uh, don't corporations get their reputations based on sort of like how they evolve and the companies that they consume and stuff like that? I would say, um, ask me a few novels down the line and maybe I'll have an answer. Scone or scone? Scone. Jam or cream first? So I'm lactose intolerant, so it would be just jam. And that could be a controversial thing to say, but needs must. Um, would Mr. Inkpen accept a one-way only ticket to Mars if offered one? Asking for a friend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, leaving out that last bit there, I'm just going to focus on the question. Um, so I asked, I asked them this and um, the answer was, it depends what I'd be doing. Um, if I was going there to become a farmer, then no. If I'd be going to be a software developer, then yes. And we did have this chat before, uh, so they're not just being heartless. Uh, it came up, we were watching um, something and I was like, hey, if this ever came up, would we go? And I think like the answer was, Yes, because as much as it would suck, it's the biggest thing you could ever do, ever. It's like the ultimate exploration and humans are inherently curious and it's what we're built to do is just to explore and spread and do all of that. And that is just fundamental. And so imagine, imagine if you got given that chance and then the person you were with just put their foot down and refused to let you go. But you know, and you wanted to go. Like, I couldn't do that to them. And I don't think they could do that to me either. Like, um, we, we did have this chat and it was like, yeah, it's just too big. And even if it all went tits up and the whole thing exploded, the fact is it's the ultimate thing, you know? Yeah. So yeah, they'd probably go, unless they were there to plough fields, which I think is fair enough. You know, early settlers normally are just farmers, really, on a new planet. And yeah, no, they're terrible at gardening. They'd be the worst, honestly. Okay. How many pens can an ink pen ink if an ink pen could ink pens? Ah, uh, so much ink with an ink pen pen if an ink pen could pen ink. <laughs> There we go, that's my answer. Um, what's your favourite manga series? It's got to be Death Note, still. That one was the first one. It really blew my mind and I love it, um, even if it's sexist. And it really is, but I do love it. Um, what is a genre you would find difficult to write in? 
Okay, so this is reasonably straightforward. Historical nonfiction would be really, really difficult for me um, because it's confined. There's a lot to research. There's not enough creativity in terms of how you can deviate with the story for obvious reasons. Um, and because historiography is a thing and people write over history again and again and again until there's nothing true anymore. We don't really know. And if I was writing historical nonfiction, I would be adding to this pile of historiography that's already come, That we're, that's another way of just smothering the truth of what probably actually happened. And so, yeah, even on a sort of ideological basis, I would find that really challenging. Um, how many words have you made up? Lots. Lots and lots. Because uh, I have snippets of languages, alien languages, that come up in the Dex legacy. Um, so all of that needs to be invented, uh, dependent on the phonetic propensities, as we've already talked about, for different languages. Um, yeah, so lots of words. Lots and lots of words. My favourite is um, that I made up for a different planet. Uh, same universe, different planet. Um, but the word is Harvasa, and, ha and in this world they have 27 words for silence um, for some key reasons. Um, but Harvasa means the type of silence when all you can hear is your heartbeat. And we've all been there, I think, probably in, in moments where it's just so quiet that your heartbeat sounds loud in your ears. And that's that's the silence, that's the, the heart silence is what it's called, the Havasa silence, the heart, yeah. And that's my favorite, and it, it comes up a lot in, in my head. Anyway, I don't quote myself, but in my head, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, Havasa, it's, it's that kind of quiet. Um, how long have you played the piano and how often do you manage to get practice in with everything else? Okay, so piano practice has been hard lately. Um, I've played since I was about six years old and um, because of that, I should be way better than I am. But, you know, hey ho, um, it's really good for me mentally speaking and I should get back into it uh, more than I am. I go through phases where I practice really, really often and then phases where that's less the case. Um, if I didn't work full time, I would practice every day. I know that. Um, but at the moment, because I work full time and then I finish work and then I start writing, I literally don't have the bandwidth to sit and moodle about on the piano for an hour. And that's kind of what you need to do. You need to like, you know, warm up, play a couple of pieces and then like have some fun, maybe make up a few tunes or at least that's what I always want to do. Um, and you need to have at least an hour to sort of play around in that sense. And I just don't, I really don't. I used to, but I don't anymore. And it's kind of sad and my piano sitting there. It needs tuning. Lockdown hasn't been kind to it. Um, piano tuner, it needs, it needs to be done like once a year and they haven't been able to come near or by. So yeah, I need to get that done. Um, do you have a favorite classical piece and a favorite modern piece of music? Okay, so Prokofiev's Piano Concerto number no. three in C. Uh, especially Opus 26, uh, the Andante bit. Um, that one is insane. Listen to it and weep. <laughs> um, I'll stick a Spotify link in the description down below. Um, and yeah, it's just for the piano alone. I'm like, um, more generally speaking, probably Vaughan Williams, Variations on a Theme by Thomas Tallis and Scheherazade by Rimsky korsakov Elgar's Cello Concerto and the Nimrod Variations, stuff like that. The Romantics just, oh my god, yeah. Um, I've talked before about Frizen, the, the actual physical chills that some people get, that actual physical reaction to music, and I definitely get that, and Thomas Tallis and Elgar's Cello Concerto and the Nimrod Variations really set me off. It's like fireworks down my spine. Love it. I'm sitting there going, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's really nice. Um, so a favourite modern piece would be Birds in Warped Time 2 by Seto. Um, and I sometimes play that and lay down and close my eyes and it makes me feel like I'm floating. It's 
really wonderful if you just actually really listen to it and I find like Japanese composers especially have this way of making something sound incredibly effortless and simple in execution but when you try and execute it it is really not it's complicated AF and I've tried to execute not this one this the, the birds in warp time one nuts I wouldn't even go near that way beyond me um but it's amazing I definitely recommend again link in the description below check it out it's gorgeous um what are your thoughts on past versus present tense usage? Thoughts? Not sure. Present tense is more immediate, past tense is more universal. Um, I tend to think of present tense as belonging with first person perspective, um, maybe because of the immediacy of it, um, but I tend to write whatever the story calls for. So I find if I'm telling a certain story, the tense, will be necessary in order to tell that story best and then I just go with that so I could say oh yeah it's third person all the way and then the next story I write is going to be in first person present and then it's like you know I tell I tell whatever the story needs really um how much do you agree that the setting narrative and characters are each embodiments of an aspect of their authors or their world views okay so this is an interesting question. Um, I am generally a serious advocate of the idea that as soon as a book or a song or a piece of music or something is out in the world, it belongs to whoever consumes it. But I think that when you're creating something, inevitably you put yourself into it. So it's like passing on DNA to a child, like you couldn't conceive a child by whatever method and expect to have nothing of yourself in it. And you can't conceive a book and expect it to be independent of your views. I don't think that would be possible. I don't think. Um, that's why writing can be so hard uh, in terms of self-discovery. And I came to realise a few things about my personal experiences while writing The Dex Legacy. Um, and that's been really hard some experiences have come to light that I found I was drawing on in order to get the emotional impact of what was happening in the narrative. And then I realised where those emotions were coming from and how I knew what to write in those moments. And I realised some things about my past and that was really hard. Some things hit me really hard. Um, but I think it's part of the job. And it's what comes, like, so much self-awareness comes from writing. And, you know, if you're, if you're writing and you're writing from the heart, a lot of stuff comes from that in terms of, like, self-awareness. And I don't think you can avoid it. It's just part of... You come out the other side of writing a book and I think sometimes you're just a different person. Or just have a, di a deeper understanding of who you are. It's my experience anyway, of probably not everybody's experience. But yeah, I there are certain bits in the writing that I've done that I found quite fundamentally challenging, retrospectively. So yeah, I guess there's a lot of myself in there. I'll deal with it later. <laughs> I'll, I'll be working on that. <laughs> so how do or would you approach writing characters whose background, personality and values are widely different from your own? Okay, uh, well, research helps, but I've got characters in the Blood Road who have been born and raised on a different planet. And they belong to a culture that is definitely haunted by displacement. So, you know, their entire planet has been artificially seeded by a race that left them there and then buggered off. And um, as a result, you know, I mean, they've, they've got these questions about where they came from, why they were left and, and how that all happened. And, 
you know, there's, there's, there's certain mental hang-ups there that come out all the way through the narrative. Um, and I've got characters who are motivated by absolute empathy. And we're talking about absolute empathy. So they're like where your, where your psyche sits, which is normally rooted in the ego. And then from ego experience, ego based experiences, you're able to sympathize and empathize. Uh, where their center sits is equally placed between ego, empathy, sympathy, and all of those things. So it's much more equally like they their sort of center there is anchored in a more neutral space. Um, so yeah, I've got a character like that. Um, I've got others who are driven by a complete lack of empathy and inability to empathize with anybody. Um, and I'm like, none of these characters, you know, I'm, I'm not displaced and I'm not driven completely by empathy. No, I'm very anchored in my ego. Thank you very much. And, um, but I do have strong empathy. So I'm not someone who struggles to empathize, um, with other characters. Um, and I mean, I guess even though I don't necessarily identify with them, like they're, they're complete and whole people to me. And I am sympathetic to them. And I just think of them as whole people. Um, they're different people. I'm not sure how else to say this. I think a certain amount of characterization has to be intuitive. And I think that's where artistry comes in. Um, how to capture those people and the essence of those people even though they're not you, in any way. Um, I think that's maybe artist, that's artistry, maybe. Um, yeah, good question, really good question. Um, you previously spoke about your fear of losing motivation for writing being a driving force, but have you ever lost it and stopped before? If so, what happened and how did you get it back and start again? Okay, so I wrote three books in my early teens and then I got to A-levels in university and I lost motivation. I still wrote, but it was much more forced and uh, it was on purpose. Um, and then when my dad was dying in my third year of uni, I started a thing where I'd write a blog post every single day um, and I called it a sanity project, um, but it was just to sort of be producing something every day. Um, and feel like I'd made some kind of contribution to anything. Um, and that was really good practice. Uh, there's nothing quite like relentlessly hammering out a skill on an anvil to get good at it. Um, but then again, after that, no writing for a while, but then I did have a blog with like 85 articles on it. That was a pretty strong sp starting point, you know, for sort of applying for jobs and stuff, it'll be like, oh yeah, I've got a blog and it's not just got five articles on it, it's got 85 articles, that's significant. Um, so a couple of years ago, after not really writing anything for any, any amount of time, um, a serious plot point fell into my head and the blood road unraveled before me. And the thing is like the characters in the blood road have been with me for the better part of like 15 years. And I'm a big, Le Guin believer um, that sometimes a story needs to ferment and become and for the words to find the right rhythm and that's a Virginia Woolf idea the, the rhythm of words like if a story isn't quite getting onto those like fitting onto the tracks it's because you haven't found the rhythm in your head that will carry the words forward um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you're a writer you're a writer and a dry spell only feels like that because you're not writing words down. But that's because the words aren't ready yet. And you've just got to trust in yourself and trust in the words. The words will come. And something, one day, you'll be in the shower and suddenly boom, something will click in your head and everything will just roll out in front of you and it will be like... Ah, and then, and then you, there will be nothing stopping you. But you've just got to give yourself 
the space and allow that cognition to happen. Um, there's something about epilepsy and, and I'll talk about this uh, at length in another, like at another time, but you really learn to appreciate your brain and the post process of brain like healing and connections being made when you've had a big epileptic seizure, you can almost feel it happening in the aftermath. And well, I can anyway, like I, I went through this really interesting process. And as a result, I'm really mindful of the fact that our brains just need time sometimes. They're organic computers. They just need time sometimes to make the connections and the ideas need to formulate and it's not a direct path and it does take time and giving yourself the time, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, if you're going through a dry spell, allow it to happen. It's not because you're not being productive, it's because it's not ready yet. And yeah, relax, let it happen. It won't last forever. It's fine. You're good, you've got this. <laughs> um, What's the hardest lesson you've learned in writing so far? Or is there one you're still trying to learn? Okay, the hardest lesson. I'm never going to be as good as I want to be. Never. But that's okay. And it's good. Because it means I'm always going to be trying. Doesn't matter what I do or achieve. I don't think I'm ever going to feel good enough in my head but I have a feeling that if I did feel good enough and if I did suddenly think that I was really good at what I was doing I might become an asshole <laughs> so I would rather I would rather be working on it constantly and getting there but I think knowing that you're never going to be as good as you want there's nothing wrong with that we're all learning and we should always be learning it's the joy of life God. <laughs> are there particularly challenging topics you like or want to tackle via writing this is a good one okay so um something that's interesting for a while is the concept of uh what it means to be truly alien um so to create a race that is nothing like human and that race to have a complicated past and history that is nothing like anything we've experienced or heard of and to, you know, like to be able to communicate that in, still in human forms, I guess, in, in our language, but be able to communicate an idea that is completely not human. Um, and it would be so hard to reach that level of originality. So hard! But, hey, maybe it can be done. Maybe I'll do it. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Um, would you release Lola's theme on Spotify? I'll look into it. Um, I have to do a decent recording first, um, but I've invested in a good mic recently, so um, yeah, I'll look into that. I'll get my piano tuned. <laughs> um, favourite Pokemon generation and favourite Pokemon from it? This is easy. First generation, obviously. Um, there's the, um, yeah, I mean, like, first generation. People only want the plushies from the first generation. 100%. There's no need for all the new ones. Um, I have this thing that Nintendo seem to add to a franchise by just putting more stuff in it. And, you know, rather than furthering the plot or anything like that. And so in Pokemon Red, you've got, you know, you become the greatest trainer. Uh, but in the sequel, you could have started as the greatest trainer, defending your title and perhaps teaming up with other big trainers to overcome something. But instead, you're always just starting out and becoming the greatest trainer over and over again. And the only thing that changes is that there's new Pokemon around. And yeah, it like, why? There are only so many Pokemon you can know the names of and you can nerd out over. And like some of them, you're really looking at them thinking, oh, you were scraping the barrel here, weren't you? Um, yeah, quality, not quantity. And yeah, so first generation and Charmander, obviously obvious okay favorite anime series past and present aha uh -huh. so when i was a teenager i went through this really niche uh, fruits basket phase um learned a lot about chinese uh, about the uh, sort of zodiac kind of 
mythology through that. That was fun. Um, and then Death Note again. And now I'm working my way through Sword Art Online, which is great fun. And I'm really enjoying that. Uh, I got a t-shirt, so that's how committed I am. <laughs> so, there we go. Pineapple on pizza. Okay. Uh, I'm a rare case of giving zero shits about this. Um, <laughs> I mean, I kind of put it down to the life's too short category. If you like it, eat it. If you don't, don't. <laughs> I, I struggle to come up with any kind of emotional response to this argument. Um, oh, and we're on the last one. Okay, so this isn't a question, but I kind of promised a while back when I revealed to the world that Ink Pen is actually my name, my real name, and people were asking, okay, how did it come about? Well, they were, they were assuming it was my birth name, and I was like, it's not my birth name, it's my married name, but it's a bit more complicated than that. So I, I promised I would tell you in the next Q&A. So, the story of ink pen. Um, when my spouse and I, we were talking about names and I didn't like their surname and they didn't like mine. And I wasn't gonna change my name unless it was a clear level up from my previous name. Um, but we wanted to share a name because, you know, like we were becoming a new family between, you know, the two of us, we wanted to be a new family together. and. So we tried various versions of the double barrel thing, like in our heads we were like discussing this and like smashing our names together, double barreling and everything just sounded awful. Um, and yeah, so then I was like, well, what about mother's maiden names? And they were like, okay, what's yours? And I, and I said, and they were like, eh, eh, don't like it. So fine. And then I said, okay, what's your mother's maiden name? And they said, oh, ink pen. And I remember we were walking along a harbour path at the time, like we lived at the end of it. And I just stopped in my tracks and I was like, how are we even having this conversation? Ink pen? Of course that's going to be our name. That's the most amazing name in the world. <laughs> so yeah, we sort of, we decided on that. And before we got married, they changed their name via deep hole and then on the wedding day, I took their name. So that was sort of the traditional way um, in terms of me taking their name, but they'd changed it before. So we both changed our name when we got married and yeah, best name ever. <laughs> I definitely advocate that. Don't change your name unless it's a level up and hunt around for different options because there's gonna be one that's awesome. Somewhere in the family, somewhere in the family, you've got a name in there that is just brilliant revive that bring it back reclaim it you know go with the awesome why not <laughs> um okay so uh that's uh that's the end of the q a for ten thousand followers the end um thank you guys uh sorry if i rambled a bit there in places um Hopefully it's not too long. How long have I been going for? One hour? Ah, okay. <laughs> well, me signing off then. And um, if you've made it this far, thanks very much. And um, I'll answer your questions again if I get to 11,000 followers. Um, see you, bye.